Thank you for joining us today at Hope Church. We exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower. We hope you enjoy the service. Today, uh, with Family Worship Sunday, I've got these friends join me on stage, and they're going to help me tell a story out of Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar. (laughs) He made a gold statue, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. Oh, 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 we got to, yeah, that's good. Good. We're we'll, we'll gonna put it up higher. We'll put it up higher. Put it back here. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Gold statue, ninety feet tall, nine feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messengers to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of this statue that he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then a herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all the other musical instruments, bow down to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. It's over here, furnace. (laughs) So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bow to the ground and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But... Some of the astrologers went to the king, and they informed on the Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree. And that decree required that all the people bow down and worship your gold statue. But king, that decree also stated that those who refuse to obey that will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But, oh, king, there are some Jews, three Jews named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They pay no attention to your commands, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods, and they do not worship this gold statue that you have set up. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar flew, flew into a rage and, or, and, ordered, and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. And when they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue that I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. We do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into that blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he does not, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue we have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that he, that he had the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. 
And then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their clothes and turbans and pants. <laughs> and because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fall into the roaring flames. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumps up from his seat in amazement, and he exclaims to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, I see four men unbound and walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth, the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close to the, as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors all crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads or their body was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. That's some hair right there. <laughs> they didn't even smell like smoke. <laughs> then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied my commands and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any God except their own. Therefore, I make this decree of any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Amen. Amen. Give these guys a hand. Joey, Corbin, Mark, Alex, thank you guys so much. Awesome job. Awesome job. Well, I hope you find with this story that we just kind of acted out in Daniel chapter 3, that the real danger for us in the human race is idol worship. It's idol worship. Idols that we are tempted to worship as adults, as parents, some of us, idols that we are tempted to put in front of our children, idols that our kids are being tempted to worship. What is an idol? Got that definition on the screen for you. An idol is when something or someone becomes in, more important to us than God. Let me give you some examples of idol worship today. I was watching the NCAA basketball tournament. And last weekend, I was watching the game between the University of Arkansas and the University of Kansas. Arkansas upset Kansas. They beat them. And after the game, the whole crowd that was there during the Arkansas game did a cheer that's very popular if you understand who the University of Arkansas is. The University of Arkansas's mascot is a razorback. It's a real thing. It's a pig with razor-sharp tusks. So that's their mascot. And they do a cheer that they call calling the hogs, all right? And so I saw them do the cheer calling the hogs. I mean, I've been in arenas before uh, in, in, in watching them play basketball, and I've watched them with my own eyes call the hogs, okay? So I've seen this for years and years and years, this cheer that they do. But as I was watching this cheer, all I could see was adults that were worshiping. I want to show you a picture of the call the hogs cheer. Now, men and women, 
Hands raised. Okay, I'm going to show you what it is. I am not an Arkansas fan, all right? So if you are, I apologize, all right? So I'm not trying to shamelessly plug the University of Arkansas here, but here is their cheer, all right? Here's the call the hogs, right? This is what they're doing. They all raise their hands in the air. They do it three times. They go, hey, pig, suey. Hey, pig, suey. One more time. Hey, pig, suey, razorbacks. All right? That's their cheer. And all I could think about was my friends who were pastoring in the great state of Arkansas. And when the people in their church sing songs, it's too much to ask the people in their church to celebrate the grace and love of God by lifting their hands in worship. But they can do this at a basketball or a football game. Or, last night and Friday night, we just had, in our city, one of the biggest, right now, world tour concerts that's happening in the world, present day. Taylor Swift was here at Allegiant Stadium, where the Raiders play, on Friday night and Saturday night. Over 40, close to 50,000 fans there to see Taylor Swift in concert. Now, she did a three-hour concert herself, 44 songs in her set, which tells us she loves her fans. She's honoring her fans, doing all these songs, and that, that's awesome. That's great. But in our country, there are many people who are tempted to worship celebrities. I just want to show you a picture of her concert. Hands lifted high, singing the songs that she wrote. From the worship of sports teams to the worship of celebrities, there are many things that are in our world today that tempt us to worship those things rather than worshiping God. Things like our identity. Our identity might be one of the biggest idols that we worship today. As we look at modern idols, here's the thing. None of us are really thinking about this gold statue and being like, there's no way I bow down to a gold statue. I'm not going to do that. But there are modern day idols like celebrities and sports teams and then our identity where we have abandoned who we are in Christ and placed our identity in other things, things like social media following or our position at work or our abilities or skill set or the achievements that we attain. Many of us have our identity wrapped up in the wrong things. Another modern day idol is money, material things. Our culture has bowed down to the idol of money and possessions for generation after generation after generation. We've completely missed that God owns it all. And he's the giver of all things. We simply just try to get all the things so that we can have all the things at the expense of any kind of gratitude towards God. Our jobs, our status is a, another idol today. Jobs used to be a means to an end, something for people to do to provide for their family. Now, what you do has become who you are. Today, job dissatisfaction is at an all-time high. And maybe job dissatisfaction is at an all-time high because we've elevated what we do to who we are. Could it be that that has become an idol in your life? Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't find a job that fits your skills, that you should enjoy. I'm not saying that you should put up with bad working conditions. I'm simply pointing out that maybe part of the problem is we've made our jobs an idol. Or another modern day idol is our physical appearance. You don't have to look very far today. 
to see advertisements that promise to fix your physical appearance, to make you look better, to make you look younger, or to look like even your favorite celebrity. Why do we have these things? Because we are worshiping our physical appearance. We spend hours in the gym, thousands of dollars on products, and constantly think about what others are going to think about us when they see us. Again, I'm not saying all that's bad. Going to the gym is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Taking a shower and fixing your hair is a good thing. Please do that. We gotta be careful to not let that good thing become the ultimate thing. We've got a world screaming at us that we need this. We have to remind ourselves what's true. Another modern day idol is comfort. There's an endless list of products promising to simplify and add comfort to our life. Things that used to take days to do now only take minutes to accomplish. Menial tasks are now automated but the call that Jesus gives his followers is the call that's not comfort. In fact, he promises his followers will face trials and persecutions and difficulty. And while comfort isn't bad, it can become damaging when it becomes the main pursuit in our life. You say, Jeff, why is that? Because when comfort is an idol, when God begins to ask you to do a difficult thing, you struggle with it. Phones, technology is another modern day idol. Smartphone addiction right now is at an all time high, especially true for our Gen Z and millennial generations, but not limited to them. Grandparents, I've been around a lot of you looking down at your phones. For many of us, we simply cannot live without our phones. It's gotten so out of hand that even while we're sitting still for a few minutes, we think, oh, let's, well, I got my phone. I got to figure out what did I miss? How many likes did I get? What kind, of follow, what kind of followers do I have? And we can't sit in silence for five minutes without refreshing the feed to see if we missed anything. You might have an idol there. And here's the truth. In these days, our kids are getting introduced to this idol at a younger and younger age. Screen time has become more and more popular where kids are buried in screens. And I'm telling you, it is a recipe that we're creating for our children to build that into an idol. The last one I'm a little hesitant to include, but hear my heart, okay? Family and children. And let me be clear, your spouse and your children are blessings from God, all right? The Bible's blatantly clear about your spouse and your children being blessings from God. But we have the tendency as people to worship the gifts rather than the giver. And for some, your family, your kids, your spouse have become an idol. Let me be clear again. I'm not saying that you need to get rid of your spouse and your family, your kids, all right? I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that we should place our families in proper perspective. We need to say, hey, they're important, but they're not as important as God. You know this? If you place your family, if you place your spouse or your children on your altar of worship, can I just tell you this? Your spouse or children will fail you every single time. In fact, every other idol we just talked about, any idol that exists in our world today, if we begin to worship those and place those on our altar of worship, every idol will fail us 100% of the time. It may work for a little bit. It may appease for a little bit, but it will not satisfy you. There's only one who will satisfy you, and that is God and God alone. So how do we combat idol worship in our lives and in the lives of our children? Well, number one, we need to focus on our creator and not on created things. Focus on our creator and not on created 
things. Look at uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 21. It says, yes, they knew God, and they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Listen to this, verse 25. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. This pretty much says it all right here, right? We need to focus on God, our creator. We need to worship him as God because any other thing that we worship is just a false idol because it's a created thing or person that we are worshiping. And that created thing or person will never satisfy us the way God will. Number two, understand how we combat this idol worship with ourselves and with our children. Understand that we were created to worship. We're created to glorify God, and he wants us to glorify him. The psalmist David wrote in Psalm 29, verse 2, Honor the Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. God desires us to worship him, to honor him. The Bible also says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Everything we do should be done for the glory of God. When we do everything for the glory of God, that means we're not worshiping any other idol. Do you know we're all created with a desire to worship? You were knit together in your mother's womb, and when you came out, you came out with a desire to worship. So here's the question. The question is not what, it's not if we're going to worship, it's what or who we worship. And here's the truth. God allows you to choose. In God's loving pursuit for you, he allows you to choose. Why? Because he didn't make robots. He gives you the opportunity to choose who or what you worship. And you know what that means? That means this. God knows you are going to worship someone or something. You are. You're wired. You're hardwired to do it. We all are. It's how we were created. God desires you to worship him. He knows if you worship him, then you'll have satisfaction and peace in life. He knows you'll have, you'll understand who he is and his character. He knows if you worship him, you can begin to get closer to him in relationship with him. He desires that. But he's not going to force that. In fact, God knows it so much that he hardwired you to worship that in his list of 10 commandments that he gave Moses to tell the people, The first two commandments had to deal with idol worship. The first of the Ten Commandments, number one, is that you must not have any other God before him. God said, hey, I know you're hardwired to worship, and what I would like for you to do, here's my commandment. I would like for you, as the people that I created, I would like for you to have no other God other than me. I know you're going to be tempted I know you're going to desire to worship maybe other things, but I want you to worship me. He follows the first commandment with the second commandment, and the second commandment sounds kind of similar. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any 
other gods. God's saying, hey, I want you to worship me. I know you're going to be tempted to worship these other idols, but I'm telling you, I, those other idols will fail you, and I want you to worship me. I want a relationship with you. And if you're in the room today and you say, hey, I don't have a relationship with God. I've never begun that. I don't know what that looks like, but today I want to begin a relationship with him. We want to help you get there. We want to help you understand that God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for sins that we committed. By dying a gruesome death on a cross, he was buried and three days later he rose again, forever defeating the power of sin and death over the lives of anyone who would place their faith in him who would say, I don't want to worship any other little G gods or idols. I want to worship the one true God. And he'll give you peace and forgiveness and grace and love and mercy. He desires a relationship with you. Well, the last way that we battle idol worship, number three, we live lifestyles of worshiping God. Look in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. What's the way to worship him? Singing a song? No, he says the way to worship him is by offering your bodies, offering your life, saying, God, here I am. Here I am. I surrender to you. I want a relationship with you, God. Here I am. You know, we've kind of mixed this up a little bit in our culture today, haven't we? We've said the word worship, and we think songs. Corbin's leading us in songs, and so he's worship. Can I just tell you this? With songs, song is songs. Worship in songs is a little tiny sliver of the whole worship pie. Did you know when you got up this morning and you took a breath, if you said to God, God, thank you for waking me up this morning, you know what? That's worship. If you're driving on your way to church today, you made it safely and you got excited about being here with all the people and you said, God, thank you for getting me to church today. You said that prayer, that's worship. You walked in here, you said hi to somebody. You may have walked up to somebody you didn't know. You say, hey, thanks for being here. Glad to see My name's this. What's your name? And you met, guess what? That's worship. You saw videos of kids and it brought a smile to your face because the, the joy of the children and, and, and them talking about things of God just brought you joy to your heart. Guess what? That's worship. And singing songs that we've sung today, yes, that's worship. You know what else is worship? Hearing the word of God preached, that's worship. You know what else is worship? Our response song at the end, that's a worship song, but you know what else it is? It's a worship uh, moment for you to be able to say, God, is there anything that I've heard today through the preaching of your word or through the music that I need to respond to? God, is there anything that's going on in my life that you're convicting me of, Holy Spirit, because I want to be affected today by you and your presence and by your word and these songs? God, is there anything? That's worship. You get in your car, you go home, you hang out with family, you sit there in your chair and or you're on your couch and you just marvel at the blessings that God's given you. That's worship. You get lunch ready and you pray over lunch. That's worship. He said, Jeff, okay, we get it. <laughs> but it's worship. Living a lifestyle of worship where everything you do allows you to see that God's in it all. And you're not worshiping any other thing. Well, verse 2 of Romans chapter 12, we just read verse 1, verse 2 tells us more of how to do this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You know what's interesting? The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know what they did? They looked at the, the behaviors and customs of the world that they lived in. You know what they did? 
they decided not to copy those. Three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thousands of people, the musical instruments play. They all bow down, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, 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 we're not going to copy the behaviors and customs of this world. We're going to stand, and we're going to worship the one true God, because the behaviors and customs, even of the world in our day, is pushing us all the time to find some kind of idol to worship. Some kind of excuse to worship anything but the one true God who's the only one who can satisfy our needs and desires. Here's a final word to the parents in the room. When it comes to leading your children through this world (laughs) that is doing everything it can to grab the attention of your children to worship all of these different kind of idols from video games to TV programs to all the things in between, celebrities, music, all of the things that the world throws at us. How can we as parents help navigate our children through all of this idol worship being thrown our way? Well, remember this, parents. You are the primary disciple makers for your children. You are. And more often times than not, they watch what you do more than they hear what you say. (laughs) If you say, hey, stop using that filthy language in my house, and then you're watching a game, and your team throws an interception or fumbles the ball or misses a bucket, and you use filthy language because you're mad at that player or at that team, guess what? They didn't hear what you said. They're watching what you do. Well, that ups the game a little bit, doesn't it, parents? 1 John 3, 18 says this, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. Sometimes you wonder, well, I take my kids to church, and man, I'm really trying to raise my kids right and trying to do all these kind of things. I just don't know what's going on. It probably could be you. It's because they're watching what you're doing. And what you do and what you say are two different things. And I'm telling you this. I was a student pastor for 16 years. For 16 years of my life, I gave my life to 6th through 12th graders. That's a long time. But you know what I discovered? With 11 to 18-year-olds, they sniff out fake just like that. And when you say this and you do this, fake and they sniff it out you're like i don't understand why my teenagers rebellious because they see you being rebellious it's like, ouch jeff can you move on <laughs> well, we talked some about actions but let's finish with how we can teach them with our words deuteronomy 6 verse 4 through 7 says listen O israel the lord is our god the lord alone and you must love the lord your god with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to those commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again. Listen to this, to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. You know what I'd love for us to notice right here? Moses didn't say, parents, be sure to bring your kids to synagogue every week. Make sure you bring your kids to those professionals, those people at the church. All they do is think about investing in your kids. So yeah, bring them up here to the professionals. That's not, what, that's not what he says. You know what he says? You're the professionals. You're like, oh. <laughs> Nobody knows your child like you do. Here's the thing, though. I wish instead of the placenta that comes out after birth, I wish the placenta was substituted in for an instruction booklet. 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Baby comes out, instruction booklet's next. And every instruction booklet would be different, right? Like, my instruction booklet for one child is not the same instruction booklet as it is for the other child, I promise. Wouldn't that be great? Then we'd all be professionals. We'd all be studied up, but we're not, we're not. And I know there are times you don't feel like a professional parent, but God didn't make a mistake when he gave you your kids. That's why all throughout the Bible, it's clear that parents are the primary disciple makers of their children. It's not the job of the pastor. It's not the job of ministry leaders. It's not the job of the church primarily. It's the job of the family unit. Whatever that family unit looks like in your, in your context, it's, it's our job to disciple the next generation. Now, here's the thing. Praise God for what we call supplemental discipleship, Right? Praise God for Sydney, who came in here with all these preschoolers, and they've been working all month long on their little memory verse that they said to all of us today, right? Praise God for somebody who's investing in our preschoolers and loving them and teaching them God's word. And just know this, every one of those children is prayed over by one of our uh, volunteer workers every single service, every single week. It's a value we have. Praise God for supplemental discipleship of Sydney. Praise God for supplemental discipleship of Pastor Marky Mark, who does an incredible job of loving these kids and telling them about God's love and helping them understand more and more about who God is and how they can grow in their own relationship with God. Praise God for supplemental discipleship like Pastor Marky Mark. It's the reason why when you come, you can check your kids into those places and know without a shadow of a doubt, they're gonna know God's word when they leave. Praise God for Joey Martinek, our student minister, who every Wednesday night in this room preaches the word of God to our students, helps them understand who God is and how they can grow in their relationship with him. And then they meet in small groups and sharing life and community. Every Wednesday night, our Hope students meet 6th through 12th graders in this room. Praise God for Joey giving that supplemental discipleship. But I'm telling you, it's not primary. Primary has to be in the home. That's why verse 7 of Deuteronomy 6 tells us we should be diligent about teaching them God's truth in a way that's regular and routine. There's four ways that we see that in this verse. I'll put it on the screen for you. How to parent intentionally in our daily lives. How do you get these kids to weave through all of these idols that are being thrown their way? This is how you help them have a biblical worldview. So Jeff, what does that mean? That means you take the lenses of the Bible and you put it on your kids. And the way they see the world is through the lenses of God's word. How do we do that? He says that in verse seven. Number one, when you are at home, you talk about God's word at home. You help them understand who God is. You encourage them to have their own personal God times. My son's in the room today, but uh, I already, we talked about me being able to share this, and he said, yes, um, full disclosure, I shared it without his permission in the 8 a.m. service, so I asked him after, all right, but he gave me permission after that, okay, so full disclosure, all right, um, just being transparent with you, Um, but the thing I love about him is for the last several years, that dude goes, closes his bedroom door, puts his uh, his AirPods in, turns on worship music, worships God, opens up the word, gets alone with God, journals what God's teaching him, even lights a little candle, smell up the room a little bit. He got that from Pastor Trenton, it's okay. (laughs) But how great is it that a teenager, you can teach your children and teens at home to say, hey, you can go into your room and instead of closing your room and secretly closing the door of your room secretly sinning, why don't you close the door in your room and get alone with God? When we're at home, we put the lenses of God's word on them so they can see everything we see at home through his, through his word. Number two, when you are on the go, when you're on the go, in the car, we'd go drop kids off at school. And how many of you know, the last song you hear when you get out of the car for work and you know, 
It's in your head all day, right? It's just in your head all the time. It's like, oh, Mickey, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind, you're Mickey. It's like, man, that's in my head all day long, right? Just all day, right? <laughs> so that's why we decided we were going to listen to worship music on the way to school. And when they get out of the car and they go into the school, whatever worship song they heard last is on repeat in their head. When you're on the go, constantly, hey, look at that, look at that. What's going on here? What's the Bible say about that? All those kind of things. You say, Jeff, that's overboard. I'm just telling you, that's what the Bible says. That's how you intentionally parent, by putting the lenses of the, of, of the word of God on your kids' faces and allow them to see the world through the lenses of the Bible. Which also means, parents, by the way, you need to know the word. We'll just move on. <laughs> Number three, when you're going to bed, for years and years, I think Ty was probably three when we started this, but for years and years, we just have this rotation of who prays at night. Whose turn is it tonight? Can I just tell you this with all transparency? Last night it was Sarah's turn. We still do it. Now, we've gone from four of us praying to three of us praying. We're about to go to two of us praying, but we pray every night. We rotate through. Tonight's going to be my turn. Tomorrow night's going to be Ty's. Then Sarah, then me, then Ty. I always make the joke. It feels like I pray every night, but I will if y'all want me to. But we rotate through. We pray. There's a routine that we have before we go to bed. When they were younger, we used to read the Jesus Storybook Bible. We read it, then we'd take turns praying, and then we'd go to bed. So when you're going to bed, number four, when you get up, make the morning about God. Make the morning about him. You say, well, my, my teenager doesn't like the morning. No one likes the morning. A few of you weirdos do. Morning people. Some of you are morning people, I get that. But make the morning about him. Pray together before you leave the home. When you get up, I'm telling you right now, parents, you start looking at these four simple everyday routines, these moments, you will be taking the lenses of the Bible, putting it on your kids so that they can see the world the way God sees the world. As the band comes up, that is going to help your kids understand that when they see the world through the lenses of the Bible, they'll also be able to identify all of the false idols that are out there. It'll help them identify the one true God that they need to be worshiping, and it'll help them identify the other little g, small gods that they shouldn't be worshiping. Today, as we respond, the prayer is simply this, is to remember what is an idol. An idol is... When something or someone becomes more important to you than God. So here's the question. Are there idols in your life today? Parents, are there idols in your life today? Adults, are there idols in your life today? Grandparents, are there idols in your life today? Empty nesters, are there idols in your life today? Children, are there any idols in your life today? Students, teenagers... Are there any idols in your life today that you're worshiping? Let's confess these idols. Let's lay them down at his feet today. Maybe some of you need to just take these steps and just think about, man, these, these steps. I just want to place my idol I'm concerned about that I've been worshiping at this step. I don't want to turn away and leave that idol right there. I don't know. I don't know what you need to do today. Here's the thing. If you're worried today about God going, man, I didn't know you were worshiping that idol. God knows. You're not going to God to say, God, here's the thing, God, I've been worshiping this idol. Yeah, 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 he already knows that. It's just you going to him saying, hey, God, I realize, I am admitting, I worship this idol. And God, because of that, I need to take this idol off of my personal altar of worship and I need to place it at your feet and I'm gonna put you there. You know what we're guilty of a lot of times? A lot of us do this as believers, right? As Jesus followers, it's God and he goes off and the idol comes back on. Oh yeah, that didn't work. Idol down, God back on. Okay, that's better. Oh, but this is tempting. Okay, idol on. 
and you just do this all the time, stop. Every time you put a, a, a false idol or a little G God on your personal altar of worship, it fails you every time. That's why you tried all the idols. He's the one who can only satisfy you. Lay down your idols and worship the one true God today. And lead your kids to worship the one true God today. If you don't have a relationship with God, you've never worshiped him, you've never surrendered your life to him, we just believe, the Bible says this, that you can admit you're a sinner, believe that God loves you so much, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, rose again three days later, and we can confess him as the Lord, the boss of our life. And you can begin a relationship with God today by properly placing him on your altar of worship and surrendering your life to him today. If you'd like to do that, we'd love to talk to you about it. I'll be right here on the front row during this response song. We'll have people at the red tent during the song and after church today. We'd love to talk to you about beginning a relationship with God. For a lot of you in the room, though, you're Jesus followers. Are you worshiping idols? If so, what is it? Name it, admit it, confess it, leave it, move away, turn your back on it, and go to the one who will never fail you, who will never disappoint you, who brings peace. God, will you lead us today? Holy Spirit, will you minister to us? Will you convict us today of what you're saying? God, as we respond, may we not just be mouthing the words of a song just because that's what we do, but God, may we be doing business with you that we would be looking at you saying, God, will you affect me right now? God, is there anything that I need to do to alter my life according to your word in this moment? And God, may we be obedient to however you speak to us in this time today. Lead us as we respond now. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.